Mining and environmental impact assessment laws in Queensland are a central component of the regulatory framework. So this is the fifth in our series of lectures on environmental regulation in Queensland. We're moving on from the planning framework under the Planning Act. We're going to dive into the Mineral Resources Act and related legislation. So in today's lecture, we are going to look at a problem, the New Ackland coal mine, and going to look at examine two aspects of it, an existing uh, component of it called West Pit and a proposed expansion of it called Stage 3. And we're going to ask the question, does the existing mine and its proposed new stage comply with the law? And if not, what steps need to be taken to make them comply? And then we're going to unpack some subsidiary questions as, as we've done in previous lectures. What laws regulate the mine? And particularly going to distinguish why we don't deal with this or this sort of development under the planning framework. Then we're going to look at a series of pieces of legislation that require applications for a large mine, the Mineral Resources Act, the Environmental Protection Act, the Regional Planning Interest Act uh, in particular. We'll also note the State Development and Public Works Organisation Act, Environmental Impact Assessment Laws generally, plus the Commonwealth EPBC Act. And then we'll ask the question, well, are those applications likely to be granted? And within that context, I want to just dive into, well, how are mines assessed? And we'll see that there is a broad weighing up of the costs versus the benefits of a mine. And that's quite different to the approach under the planning legislation, where there's a reference to a planning document which sets out areas where there can be different forms of development and the planning scheme is the central reference against which development proposals are assessed. In the mining context, it's much broader and much more discretionary. There's generally There generally aren't constraints imposed by planning schemes or similar documents. In recent years in Queensland, because of the concerns of impacts on farmland, the Regional Planning Interest Act was passed. And so there is a component of planning now uh, regulating mining and petroleum development. It's we've yet to see, though, that really um, have any teeth and be uh, any different to what the situation was prior to it. But it's there and we'll talk about it. OK, so that's the assessment process. I then want to just talk about two broad topics. Regulatory capture, which is a huge problem for environmental regulation, and we'll see how why that's the case in our examination, particularly of West Pit. And then finally, what is the central principle for environmental regulation in Queensland? Now, we explored the Adani coal mine in lecture one, and I'm deliberately not choosing that as an example a second time. It's been very controversial, very large mine, don't want to deal with that, want to deal with a, a different case study. And in lecture one, I talked about how climate change is a massive issue for Queensland's mining sector, but we largely ignore it in assessing mines. And I'm going to ignore it in this lecture. I'll talk about it in lecture nine, but two reasons for ignoring it, uh, in well, a major reason for ignoring it in looking at mining is that that's the reality of how it's dealt with under the mining framework in Queensland at present. We uh, recognise, or the courts and regulators recognise climate change as an issue, but we use this false accounting approach uh, where we say, if we don't mine it here, then the coal would come from somewhere else, therefore there won't be any impact on climate change. So by doing that, we say, well, there's no impact, therefore it doesn't weigh against the approval of a mine in Queensland. So that's the general approach that's been taken in the last decade in Queensland. We regulators and industry try and ignore climate change as, as, as much as possible. So it's basically like this little boy with his fingers, his fingers in his ears saying, la la la, I can't hear you, climate change. And I use this cartoon in lecture one as well, which I really like. It's a uh, man standing there saying, okay, is there anything about the proposed coal mine that we haven't covered in the environmental impact assessment? And climate change is standing behind him, the elephant in the room. Australia is already confronting the horrific impacts of the failure of our climate policies. We saw that in the huge bushfires in, over uh, Christmas. 
and we have seen massive coral bleaching on the Great Barrier Reef already uh, in a number of years. Currently there is ongoing coral bleaching or extensive coral bleaching occurring on the Great Barrier Reef. We don't know the full extent of it this year. Uh, it will play out over the, the coming weeks what, what that data comes out. But climate change is an enormous issue for the mining sector in Queensland. It's the elephant in the room, but we, we rarely... Well, really, mines don't get stopped because of climate change. We use that false accounting approach or what I've called previously the drug dealer's defense. If we don't sell it, someone else will. So also want to just mention a couple of lessons that I've already talked about in lesson, lecture one. There's a witch's brew of complex technical issues often in environmental regulation. And many people complain about the complexity of environmental and planning laws and mining laws. But no matter how simple you make the law, the factual complexity will remain. And there's no simple solution to many planning, development and mining issues because they're complex factually. And one of the major reasons for choosing the new Ackland uh, coal mine expansion is because it's factually complex and legally complex. And I don't want to shy away from that by, you know, just talking about the law in the abstract. We could, you might think it'd be simpler if I didn't go into a lot of detail about a real example. But if I didn't do that, then you've, you'd be left with this false impression that these laws are neat and orderly and play out. And I could teach you about a whole heap of uh, rules and you know, put it all there on a single bit of paper. And you look at it and you go, oh, I, I need to know that. And then I know what the law is. You could learn a whole heap of rules, but you wouldn't know what the law was because the factual complexity of applying those laws makes them incredibly difficult uh, to apply in reality. So difficult disputes with lots of competing interests and stakeholders are common in this context. And New Ackland coal mine is a, an epitome of, of that. So in this course, I'm aiming to both train your technical skills for your future careers, but I also want to give you a knowledge of the values that underpin how the law is applied in practice. So I don't want to shy away from the complexity. I don't want to shy away from the value judgments that lie behind the law or that are embedded in decisions made by regulators and ministers under the law. So the focus in this lecture is on understanding the regulatory system for mining. And my aim is both to outline the basics of the regulatory system for mining, the Mineral Resources Act, the Environmental Protection Act, etc. But also to confront the com complex reality of regulating mining while at the same time not getting lost in the detail and failing to see the bigger picture of the failure at many levels. So that's what I want to try and do in this lecture. So here, the focus for this problem and for this lecture is on two interrelated aspects of the New Ackland coal mine. Firstly, West Pit, and then secondly, the stage three approval process. And if you've got a, a pad and piece of paper, you might want to write those down because I'm going to be referring to them repeatedly. I want to unpack what they mean, but they're two interrelated aspects of this mine. So West Pit and the stage three approval process. So if you want to see more extensive documents about this, I've got a case study on my website about the uh, ongoing litigation involving stages two and three of the Ackland mine. So uh, that's there. There's a whole heap of documents, particularly around groundwater. So the Ackland, New Ackland mine is located 150 kilometers west of Brisbane, out uh, past Toowoomba and Oakey. Went there for the field trip and the sites for our development application that you're doing in your group assignment are also around the mine. So if we zoom in on the mine on Google Earth, this is the most recent image and it shows a series of big open cut mine pits. The mine, just to give you a bit of a few names for that, and again, you might want to jot these down on a piece of paper because I'm just going to be talking about particularly West Pit. So in the northern part of the mine is the basically the mine administration, the, the office, but there's also the coal handling and processing plant or the CHPP for short or acronym. And the mine has had uh, three major pits for the last decade, North Pit, Centre Pit and South Pit. Because of delays in, that was, sta the stage two involved those three pits. 
But because of delays in approving stage three, which was to continue the mine south in a series of three big new pits, the mining company started in 2016 to mine an additional pit called West Pit. And that's shown in that image. So just to give you a couple of pictures of how big West Pit is in practice. So this is a photograph taken from a light plane flying to the south of the mine and looking north. And in the foreground, you can see, I'll just change the pointer. So in the foreground, you can see the township of Ackland, which was bought up. Most of the properties were bought up there uh, over a decade ago by the mining company because it at one stage planned to mine the entire town. It was planning to come south in a massive pit. It, um, I'll come back to how that was rejected in 2012. But West Pit uh, was started to be mined in 2016. You can see it shown there on that image. You can see the massive open cut pit and in the distance is center pit. And over here is the coal handling and processing plant. So further to the north. So West Pit is about 1.5 kilometers across and now about a kilometer north to south. So it's a massive pit. This is looking from the north, looking south. So that image previously, so if I just go back, here's the town of Ackland and here's the town of Ackland in this image. So this is looking north from, sorry, from the north looking uh, towards the south and just catching the edge of West Pit. So you can see there's some mining trucks, very small, just to give you an idea of scale here. So this is a massive, massive pit. And you can see the farmland stretching out uh, to the south. So this mine is located on the Darling Downs, which is some of the best agricultural land in Queensland, often called the state's southern food bowl. Very, very productive uh, agricultural land. and the conflict between farming and mining is really apparent in this sort of image. So in, in addition to West Pit, in 2017 and 2018, the mining company also extended the southwest boundary of South Pit beyond the footprint that it applied for uh, and was assessed in 2005 and 2006 for stage two. So when I talk about the expansion of West Pit, there's also this expansion of uh, South Pit um, beyond the footprint of what was applied for. And this is just an image uh, taken within the mine showing uh, the mine pit with trucks in operation. You can see here clearly the overburden and then going down into seams with uh, coal in them. It's quite clearly evident in that image. So in an open cut mine, you take off the overburden and then you dig down to the coal and you dig out all of the coal and then you take it and uh, typically you need to wash it to remove uh, as much impurities as you can from it. So you wash it and crush it to give it a uniform uh, size and consistency. So that's what's handling happening at the coal handling and processing plant. They take the coal that they've gotten from open cut pits like this and they uh, wash it and, and crush it to give it a uniform uh, consistency. And then the coal is taken by truck uh, to a rail line and uh, exported from the rail goes to uh, the port of Brisbane and it's exported from there. So the noise from a noise and dust from an operation like this comes not just from the pits but also from the coal handling and processing plant on the northern part of the mine so and also trucks. So this is um, an image showing part of the uh, coal handling processing plant. You can see here some coal after it's been uh, washed and, and um, crushed to uh, give it a uniform consistency. So that's uh, when the coal comes out of the ground, it's often called uh, run of mine coal or ROM, and that's the unprocessed coal. Um, the product coal is once it's been through the coal handling and processing plant, so it's basically then ready to be burnt. This coal, the coal from this mine, is generally used for electricity production, so it's called steaming uh, coal, and yeah, it's used in electricity production to boil water. So that's an, an important component of the mine. 
So there's a lot of money involved in a project like this. The mine currently produces four to five million tons of product coal a year. At $100 a ton, that equates to producing coal with a gross value of between $400 and $500 million per year. Now, because of the old land tenures, most of the coal uh, doesn't require royalties to be paid. So uh, the coal is owned by the landholder, which is a um, mining or related company to the mining company. And so it pays no royalties to the state. So normally for most tenures in Queensland, royalties, if, if you are a miner, you normally pay about 7% of the value of your product to the state government. And royalties are a payment to government to purchase minerals owned by the state. They're not a tax in the sense of a compulsory financial charge paid to government. Um, so they're not a tax, it's actually a payment. You're purchasing something from the government because in most tenures granted after the 1880s or 1910 in, in this case, the state reserved property in minerals when it granted them. So most freehold land in Queensland, a person owns the land, but they don't own the minerals in the land. So the government owns the minerals in the land. And if someone wants to come onto your freehold land and mine the minerals, they need a mining lease. And they, when they mine the minerals, they will pay the royalties to the state. They'll typically pay compensation to the landholder for the loss of use of their land, but the royalties go to the state. That's not the case for this mine. In, for this mine, the landowner, which is a related company of the mining company, owns the, land, uh, sorry, owns the minerals. And it's a massive, massive um, benefit uh, because it's essentially 93% of the land mine um, under the, the current uh, or the proposed stage three of the mine uh, is owned by the mining company or a related company to it. And that e equates to something like uh, a saving of $436 million over the um, life of the stage three project. So approximately $40 million would be paid, will be paid in royalties um, for if stage three pro progresses. And the mining company um, saves nearly half a billion dollars uh, in royalty payments. So that's an enormous uh, value to the company and an important reason for why this mine in a, a quite a difficult area to get approval to mine because of the surrounding neighbors because of the high value agricultural land you can see why the mining company is really keen to mine this area because it's very very valuable for them to do that and uh, more so than mining in other areas so there's a large public relations campaign funded by the company it also makes significant uh, political donations and those things are legal within our system and it's legal to run your own pr campaign if you want to look at that, you can go to saveregionaltowns.com. It's been a big uh, component of recent uh, state and federal elections has been this campaign run by the mining company to essentially um, promote political support for its, um, its mining operations because of the controversy within the community about the, the damage to farmland and then also uh, aspects of the community that support the mine that are working at the mine or have jobs associated with it. So uh, a public relations campaign like this and political donations uh, are lawful within our legal system. Now, because it lies within the middle of farmland, it's been very controversial. As I said before, the Darling Downs is often called the southern food bowl of the state. It's top quality farmland. It's surrounded by neighbouring farms. So this is a picture taken from a neighbouring farm looking down. You can see the mine in the distance. You can see over here a truck or something going along. You can see the dust from that. So no doubt that you'd be able to hear if you were there when this picture was taken, you'd be able to hear the truck so that I've been there and at night time it's the noise is horrific. You hear this clank, 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 clank of tracked vehicles and uh, and they're all changing. They're not, it's not just this nice hum or, or you know, something in the background. It's 
very intrusive and depending on the weather conditions can be uh, extreme for surrounding neighbors so in winter when there's like an inversion layer over the top of it the sound can bounce down so some nights it might be not so bad just a distant hum and then other nights it's described as like you're living in a war zone you feel like you're right in the middle of the mine because the the sound is bouncing down so so noise has been and noise and dust uh, have been huge issues for the surrounding uh, farmers groundwater impacts are also a major concern and that was a major component of the objections to the proposed stage three expansion so the landholders or a number of landholders and community members are shown in this image so there was a, a massive court case that was run in 2015 2016 in the land court of queensland in opposition to the proposed stage three this is many of the people who are involved in it the land court uh, recommended that the mining lease application and environmental authority be rejected because of groundwater impacts in particular. Uh, recently though, the mining company challenged that decision and uh, recently the Supreme Court and the um, Court of Appeal overturned that decision. There's currently a, a High Court special leave application on foot um, related to that. I'm involved in that as a barrister, so I can't um, discuss it. But essentially, there's been ongoing extensive litigation about this mine and its approvals. And here's an image of some of the people involved, some of the key people involved in uh, the uh, you know, farmers and others uh, opposed to the mine and talking there after the land court win in 2017. There's ongoing litigation about this. So because of the win being overturned by the... Supreme Court and then the Court of Appeal. Costs were awarded against the Landowner Group and it's, it's public knowledge uh, after a um, ABC report on the 1st of February this year about the mining company pursuing um, farmers who were the directors of the landholder uh, objector, um, pursuing those uh, people for cost, including this uh, elderly, elderly, elderly lady. So, uh, and I Again, I'd say I'm, I'm acting for the landholder group in the High Court Special Leave application, so I can't discuss uh, those matters in any detail uh, in this lecture. I just mention it and uh, also note um, the public reports about the ongoing litigation. So just want to give you a brief chronology of how we get to this point and where we're at. So the mine originally started in... 2000 2001 it was approved stage one started as a single pit it was approved initially for daytime operation only but soon became a 24-hour operation and then the mining company applied for stage two which is three pits north south and central pit or center pit so i'll show you a map of those three pits in a moment i've already shown you the image um, with the google earth image with those three marked so that was the original stage two approval in 2006. Then very soon after stage two was approved, it applied for a massive expansion called stage three. And the original stage three application included three massive pits, including a pit called Manningvale Pit. In 2012, the state government rejected the massive expansion of the mine and the mining company revised its stage three application to reduce the size of the pits. What is What was Manningvale pit was split into two and um, the, the remaining pits include what's now called Manningvale East. Then in 2016, the land court hearing occurred, which was this massive trial involving a big challenge to the groundwater impacts of the proposed stage three and noise in particular, as well as issues like climate change, but it was groundwater and noise were the two dominant issues in the land court hearing. Because of the delay in uh, getting stage three approved, the company started mining a new West pit, which it hadn't applied for uh, in stage two and it only has the stage two approvals at this stage it still only has the stage two approvals in in effect 
So it started this whole new pit, which you've seen the pictures, it's this massive new pit, which it never, it never applied for. Uh, how is that lawful is a question I'm gonna come back to. So it's been mining West Pit since 2016. Uh, in 2019, the Queensland Court of Appeal uh, set aside the land court, no, i correct that. The Queensland Court of Appeal found that the land court decision was affected by apprehended bias. It didn't decline to set it aside and send it back for rehearing. And that's the subject of the special leave application to the High Court, whether it should have sent it back to the land court for rehearing, having found apprehended bias. So at present, subject to the special leave application, the Queensland Court of Appeal decision stands and uh, it, it meant, it's meant that the land court hearing or land court decision has been found to be affected by apprehended bias, but still stays in effect. There was a rehearing in the land court in uh, 2017 based on, on a limited basis. And the mining company is pushing ahead with uh, an environmental authority has been granted for stage three, but it doesn't take effect until the mining lease for stage three is granted. That hasn't occurred yet. There are also outstanding approvals remaining for uh, an associated water license under the Water Act, uh, as well as a, a regional in interest development approval under the Regional Planning Interests Act uh, 2014. So there's two major approvals at least still required for the stage three to proceed. Um, both of those uh, application, both the uh, associated water license and the um, Regional Interest Planning Act application both can be appealed to court. So it may be considerable time. It's likely to be, if they are appealed, it's likely to be uh, several years before stage three is fully approved. So there are multiple remaining applications for the revised stage three at this stage. So stage two then, and what is lawfully able to be done on the existing mine site is a critical question for the miner. So this is the layout for the mine that was shown in the environmental impact statement for stage two. And you can see here North Pit, uh, South Pit, and Center Pit. So those, those were the three mine pits. The mine footprint is shown in that um, cross hatching. And down in the Southwest, so here's the town of Ackland. So in that Southwest corner, there was nothing shown. There was no pit applied for, for stage two. So West Pit is now, since 2016, the mining company has mined that entire Western corner as part of the stage two uh, approvals, it, it claims, uh, but it's something that, you know, it's a massive component that it never complied, it, sorry, it never applied to do as part of stage two. So this is a, an image showing it was part of the, one of the applications for stage two under the Commonwealth Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act. And you can see the three mine footprints um, shown there, North Pit, South Pit and Centre Pit, and nothing in this southwestern corner. Uh, and there's the town of Ackland. So how the mining company is doing that is that it basically says there was, uh, it's allowed to do it under its environmental authority because, and a crucial question then becomes, uh, is that correct? So the environmental authority is available on um, my website. You can go, on, go and have a look at it. It's a long document that sets out a number of conditions about noise and dust and water. But crucially, the Department of Environment and Heritage Protection, as it then was, now it's called the Department of Environment and Science. So it's the state environmental regulator that administers the Environmental Protection Act. When this was granted in 2006, it failed to do the most basics, the most basic thing that is typically done in any approval uh, under most pieces of legislation, most environmental approvals. The first thing that most regulators do is they take a plan for what has been applied for and they attach that plan to the approval and say, condition one normally says, the development must be generally in accordance with the approved plan. And then the approved plan is attached. So you take what was applied for and you attach it as a condition. And then 
the approval is for that development. So crucially, the Department of Environment failed to do that in this case. It failed to attach a map. So, well, it failed to attach a map that limited the footprint. It did attach some maps. So it attached, uh, for instance, as one of the uh, annexes to the Environmental Authority, it attached this map, which uh, wasn't, there was no condition limiting the, specifically limiting the mining pits to the footprint shown in this map. If it had been, it would be simple to say West Pit is unlawful, but um, this map was attached to show the water uh, monitoring locations, but it also showed the pits. So it showed North Pit here, it showed South Pit here, and it also showed Central Pit or Center Pit. It showed nothing in the Southwest corner where West Pit is now being uh, mined under purportedly under the uh, authority. So the mining company's argument is that because the Department of Environment failed to attach a map and there is no condition expressly limiting the mine pits to the area that was applied for, then they say, well, that's an implied authority that they can mine anywhere within the mining lease. So the mining lease is this larger area. They can mine anywhere within the mining lease provided they meet the other conditions of the environmental authority dealing with noise and dust impacts and those sorts of things. A major problem from, from a regulatory perspective with that is it's really hard to monitor and enforce noise conditions because it's highly variable, it's transient, uh, it can be you know, affected by you know, just weather conditions on the day, it can be uh, affected by many things and it's also expensive to monitor. So it's very difficult for landholders to uh, enforce those conditions themselves. And the state government regulator has really failed to assist them in yeah, enforcing the um, noise uh, conditions. So effectively, the surrounding landholders have been uh, left, to, left out to dry by the regulator. Uh, the mining company um, is very cagey about giving over any of its own noise monitoring um, data and claims that it can't be used for enforcement. So the conditions are very difficult to enforce in, in relation to noise and dust and those sorts of things. If there was a, a clear map limiting the, the pits to what was applied for, then it would be a simple matter to enforce the, uh, you know, the, the, those conditions because you can look at it, you can show it in Google Earth. My view is that the environmental authority, even though it doesn't attach a map, it is in effect limited to the mine footprints that were applied for. There's a, a complex, not, not too complex, but there's a, a, a detailed legal argument um, behind that. You can read it in some of the submissions that were made, if you're interested. You can read it in some of the submissions that were made to the land court rehearing about the uh, extent of authority under stage two. But the central point of it boils down to this, that even though there's no specific map attached limiting the mine footprint, neither is there any approval in the um, environmental authority for a, a range of environmental harm that's caused by the open cut pits, so the breaking up of the ground, the environmental harm associated with that. There's no authority for that on the face of the environmental authority. And on the front page of the environmental authority, it says an environmental authority authorizes the carrying out of an ERA and it does not authorize any environmental harm unless a condition stated by the authority specifically authorizes environmental harm. So it says that on the front cover and then it doesn't specifically authorize the harm that's caused by the pits. But there must be an inherent approval um, in granting the environmental authority. There must be an inherent approval for the open cut pits that were at least were applied for. And if you're going to imply that into the environmental authority, 
as I think you must, it's a necessary implication that there was authority to cause the harm associated with digging the pits that were applied for. If you're going to imply that, then the flip side is that you don't go any further than what is necessary to imply. And there is no implied authority to cause environmental harm associated with the pits beyond what was applied for. That's the argument in a nutshell. The mining company's argument is, it appears that the state government regulator has accepted or acquiesced to their argument that because the regulator failed to attach a map, too bad, so sad, we can mine anywhere we like. So that's West Pit. I really, um, well, I wouldn't, I myself don't, don't see it as a difficult um, problem. It, it's pretty astounding. It's a, it's a, it's a amazing claim to say that, well, we didn't apply for this massive pit, but the approval gives us the authority to, to do something that we didn't apply for. I mean, that's a, on, on the face of it, that's a surprising claim. So the technical legal stuff that comes behind um, the, the rejection of that uh, is, isn't as important as the, well, it, it is important, but it's, you know, the, the claim that you can you can get an approval for something you never applied for is on the face of it really uh, dubious. Um, and the authority simply, in my view, doesn't support um, the mining company's uh, argument. But the regulator appears to have accepted because they've acquiesced to West Pit since 2016, this massive pit. So that brings us on to stage three. So stage three is still in the process of being applied for. When it was originally applied for back in 2007, it was this massive, massive area. Um, so here is the existing pits, North Pit, South Pit, and Center Pit. And the mining company applied for this massive pit called Manningvale Pit, which would take out, so the, the town of Ackland was right in the middle of that. So the town of Ackland was gonna be completely removed um, for this open cut mine. Um, then there was uh, Willaroo and Sabine pits uh, as well. So this massive, massive open cut pit was proposed. That was rejected in 2012. I just mentioned here's Manningvale pit, um, what has now become, what the mining company now calls West pit, was part of the original stage three mining lease application. So at least in 2009, when it was applying for stage three, it saw that it needed approval for this um, to mine in that area. So the original massive pit was rejected by the state government in 2012 and the mining company then revised the stage three application to reduce the size of the pits that was applying for. So a common theme of or common strategy for the mining company has been essentially to build up in stages and get approval for each bit, and then you don't, you never get to assess the impacts of like a 50-year mine with stages one to seven. Um, you break it up in, into little bits that say last for five to ten years, and then you assess each um, bit of the mine in that sort of piecemeal fashion. So that's been a strategy from the original um, stage one that was just to be during the day, so a small pit just during the day, which then became 24-hour operations, which then became three um, new pits in stage two. Now stage three uh, has three pits, the revised version, Manningvale West Pit. So here's Ackland in the middle, Manningvale West Pit over to the west, Manningvale East Pit over to the east, and Willaroo Pit. And Manningvale Pit, Manningvale East Pit, so here's the town of Ackland, um, stage three applied for a big chunk of what is now West Pit, but the mining company has also mined pretty well this entire area, which was part of the, I'll just cross hatch it, this whole area is what's become West Pit. That was part of the original stage three approval. Then half of it was let go, abandoned for the stage three application in as late as 2014, though the mining company was still seeing um, what is pretty well half of West Pit as being part of the stage three application and it wasn't applying for mining of West Pit. And then in 2016, because of the delays, it 
changed its view on what it could do under its stage two approvals and that's when Westpit started. So it's been an inconsistent approach from the mining company. Now uh, the, the environmental authority has been granted but it, uh, for stage three, but it hasn't commenced and it won't commence until the mining lease um, is granted for stage three. That hasn't been done. Uh, it attaches a map, but uh, there are still problems with um, how the condition is worded. So condition A2 says, in carrying out the mining activity authorized, authorized by this environmental authority, the holder of this environmental authority must comply with figure one. And then figure one um, basically shows um, some mining pits. It doesn't, the area of West Pit uh, is vague what, what is approved. Um, and the big chunk closest to uh, Ackland, there's no approval for mining in that area at all under stage three. So it's a, it's still a, a the regulator basically hasn't learned um, the lesson from the, the stuff up with stage two and not attaching a map and the map that's attached to stage three is still problematic. So this, uh, just to reiterate, this is the uh, an extract from the what was applied for in stage two and I've put in a circle of the location of West Pit. So currently the um, stage two approvals um, on their face don't, auth well, I'll rephrase that. Um, stage two approvals are all that the mining company can rely upon at this stage. That's all that's in force. The environmental authority doesn't attach a map. Uh, even though the mining company didn't apply for West Pit, it claims that West Pit is lawful. I just go back to some principles about writing and interpreting conditions that I talked about in the last lecture for conditions uh, and development approvals because they're equally applicable under the Environmental uh, Protection Act and for mines as well. So uh, I said two points in the points that I made about writing and interpreting conditions. One of them is that an approval should clearly identify the activity that is approved and the conditions imposed upon the approval without a need to refer to the application. Uh, so the, the approval should be a standalone document that either attaches or cross references to any documents incorporated into it, such as an approved plan. So typically an approval will will state that, um, as I said, condition one will normally be the development must be generally in accordance with the approved plan and it will attach or cross reference to a plan that was submitted as part of the application. So that's standard practice. And the reason why you do that as a regulator is because generally an approval is to be interpreted as a standalone document without reference to the application material or other documents unless they're incorporated express, expressly or by implication. So it's by implication that I say the mining company is limited for its stage two environmental authority to the area that it applied for. I just wanted to mention that um, as part of the context that the mining company has also lodged an application lodged last year under the Regional Planning Interest Act. It's um, applied for um, a resource activity, which is pretty well the areas that are shown here. And it's done uh, uh, an interesting thing with the uh, application in that it's truncated what it's applied for again. So Manning Vale West Pit actually is larger than what it has applied for, as so is Willaroo. Um, and Manningvale East Pit, it hasn't included um, anything that's on the stage two land. Neither has it included the coal handling and processing plant where the coal is to be um, washed and you know, there'll be noise and dust impacts from it. So the um, question with that is whether it's a piecemeal application, whether it's valid. My view is it's not a valid application that the by leaving out um, essential parts of the project, that it's not a valid application, but it's been assessed, sorry, it's been accepted by the regulator, it's being assessed. Um, my view is it's just, it's not a valid application, particularly because it leaves out uh, fundamental or 
or essential components of the mine, which is the coal handling and processing plant. So in this mine, for instance, even if you ignore the, it's obviously left out the pit that's on, that, that it's left out West Pit um, in its 2019 application because it could hardly say, oh, well, all this area that we, you can see West Pit actually there in the, in the image. Um, it couldn't. It couldn't really apply for that in 2019, since it had been mining for mining that area for three years. It would be a, an admission that hey, we should have had approval for this and we didn't. So it's leaving that out. Um, the bits that it's left out of Manningvale and Willaroo pit seem to be to um, reduce the um, the impacts that are assessed of the mine, and it will apply for um, the extension of those pits in later stages. My view that that's invalid to do it's a, basically a piecemeal application that breaks up um, the application and never lets the the full extent of the project be properly assessed also by leaving out the coal handling and processing plan which is which is on the the land that was approved for stage one and a stage one mining lease but it's still going to be used by the stage three so for instance coal that's pulled out of Manningvale um, east pit trucks will take that to the coal handling processing plant where there's a lot of noise and dust generated by its processing then it goes on by truck down to um, the rail line so it's all inter interrelated and this stage three of this mine isn't just you know these three pits sitting in a void with nothing else around them it's actually got all these other things but the mining company, it's using a strategy of breaking its application up to try and reduce the impacts that are assessed at each stage. So I've spent a bit of time talking about the background to this mine, and I really want to make the point that you know, when we look at the mining regulation, the regulation will seem complex. We're going to get to the, the regulatory system and the, the legislation and the different tenures and the different approvals in a, in a moment. But reality is complex and hard the law that regulates mining in queensland as well as development they seem complex but they get incredibly hard when it when they actually operate in you know the complex reality so the context of the mine in the coal uh, industry in queensland i just want to mention at this point before going on to the, the legislation so coal this is some coal after it's uh, looks like it's been washed and processed to basically give it a um, consistent sort of size so it can then be um, burnt so here's uh, a um, you can see the coal here this is an open cut pit and this is the overburden above it so the dirt getting down to the coal seam so you know that coal is the result of fossilized um, plants that most of the black coal in Queensland were um, captured in the Carboniferous period about 200, 250 million years ago and basically have become fossilized. So coal is yet yeah, fossilized plants. Um, there's a lot of coal in Australia as well as globally. Uh, in If we focus in on Queensland, there's uh, several major coal basins in particular and to show you a series of uh, images of them so the most famous coal basin in Queensland and where most of the coal sector in Queensland operates from is called the Bowen Basin it's shown in blue in this map and it's uh, south of Bowen um, inland from Mackay and uh, a lot of the coal goes out from the Bowen Basin from um, the Abbott Point coal terminal at um, just north of Bowen, um, from Mackay, from Dalrymple and Hay Point, and also from Gladstone Port as well. Some coal goes out from there. So there's about 45 operating coal mines in the Bowen, Bowen Basin, some quite big ones, um, up to about 12 million tonnes of coal a year. Most of the coal is the highest grade uh, coking coal. So coking coal is used in steel production, normally sells for around $250, $300 a tonne. So valuable, it's close to the coast. It's, that coal basin has been extensively developed. To the south, uh, inland from Brisbane, we've got the Clarence Morton Basin. And there are a number of mines that were um, previously around Ipswich. Most of those have been mined out. The New Ackland Mine is part of the Clarence Morton Basin. 
and then uh, also there's some mines out in the Surat Basin, um, uh, Canby Downs uh, and the like. Wondoan is a mine that was approved a few years ago but hasn't um, commenced operations. So that coal um, comes out um, through the port of Brisbane. So if you see coal trains uh, coming through Brisbane, a lot of it's coming from New Ackland mine, but it can also be coming from uh, other mines further inland as well. So those are the southern basins. And then inland from the Bowen Basin is this um, very controversial basin called the Galilee Basin, where no mines have been developed in, in the past, but there have been a series of proposals in the last decade to develop that basin. So it wasn't developed in the past for pretty obvious reasons. Uh, it's a lot further inland uh, from the Bowen. Well, A, there was a lot of high quality coal in the Bowen Basin, which is close to the coast. And so what was the point of going inland and, and incurring the extra expense? It's, you've got to put in rail, in water, power. It's expensive to develop. And you, there's all this coal in the Bowen Basin. So mining, the mining sector is focused on the Bowen Basin. Then in the last decade, there have been several mega mines that have been proposed out in the Galilee Basin. The most famous one has been the Adani proposal for the Carmichael mine, um, but there's also several others. Um, Alpha, Kevin's Corner um, are two um, that have been proposed, and a number of others um, as well. So those none of those mines have proceeded at this stage. Uh, they face significant financial challenges uh, because of the huge capital cost to put out rail, um, rail lines and infrastructure to them as well as the outlook for coal being um, poor, both because of climate policies, you know, basically the world's got to get out of coal, and uh, also the, the um, rapid uh, deployment of renewable energy and the rapid reduction in the cost of renewable energy. So um, coal, th those um, coal mines have been proposed. Whether they go ahead in the future is really a... A difficult question to resolve at this point. It, it, um, my view, it seems unlikely simply on financial grounds, let alone um, climate issues. Okay, so that's um, background to the mind. So that's a factual context. It's complex, but I want to use that complex reality to go on to look to look at the um, legislative regime. So I want to ask, well, does the existing mine and its proposed new stage comply with the law? And if not, what steps need to be taken to make them comply? And I've given you this diagram way back in lecture one. There's many laws that regulate mining and petroleum. At a Commonwealth level, the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act is one. But most of the detailed regulation is dealt with at a state level. And there's a series of acts that are relevant. The Environmental Protection Act, the Mineral Resources Act, uh, the Regional Planning Interest Act, the Water Act, and the State Development Public Works Organization Act of five uh, important bits of legislation for this mine in particular. So I just wanted to mention why planning isn't the planning regime isn't relevant uh, as opposed to these um, other acts. So mining and petroleum activities are accepted development and therefore they don't require approval under the Planning Act due to a combination of really three points. Section 44 subsection 6 of the Planning Act says that if no categorizing instrument categorizes particular development, then development is accepted development. So that's the starting point. But then in the regulations, uh, there's no state level triggers for mining or petroleum um, set. And also the regulations prohibit local governments from making activities approved under the Mineral Resources Act or various petroleum laws. They are prohibited, local governments are prohibited from making them accessible development. That's in Schedule 6 of the regulations. So because of a combination of those three things, it means that mining is not regulated under... Mining and petroleum activities aren't regulated under the development assessment system. So mining and petroleum are regulated under um, really a series of other bits of legislation that I've just mentioned. Um, I've listed them here. So the Mineral Resources Act, I'll just summarise them. I'm going to go into them in a bit more detail, but I'd summarise them in this slide. So there's a Mineral Resources Act, which basically deals with tenure and royalty issues. Uh, so exploration permits, mineral development, 
uh, lease licenses and a mining lease grant tenure um, so effectively the the uh, ability the right to occupy the land and to extract the resource so that's granted under the mineral resources act there's also i just mentioned subsidiary to that that in 2014 the state government passed the mineral and energy resources common provisions act which deals with really compensation and overlapping resource tenures it's a subsidiary uh, issue to an important but subsidiary issue to the main tenure legislation i just mentioned that also the water act um, used to require a water license uh, mines used to need to have a water license under the water act to interfere with groundwater and that was a major uh, issue for the proposed um, stage three of the new Ackland mine and uh, in 2016 before the objection hearing in the land court was resolved the law was changed to uh, create a what's a water entitlement under the mineral resources act and after any application after 2016 um, water the mines don't require a separate approval under the water act they will be assessed under the mineral resources act and the environmental protection act for groundwater impacts but because this stage three was prior to 2016 it gets caught up in transitional provisions which require it to have an associated water license so that's the water act um, component and important for this mine but i don't highlight it there in this list because for other mines going forward the water act isn't going to be a separate approval so i've put it there as a subsidiary of the mineral resources act in this context uh, petroleum and gas production safety act deals effectively with liquid and gas hydrocarbons so coal you can just think of it simply as coal is a solid hydrocarbon um, if you're dealing with um, a gas like coal seam gas or petroleum you know like petrol liquid um, those are dealt with under the petroleum and gas production safety act so the petroleum and gas production safety act isn't relevant for the new Ackland stage three mine i'll deal with it in the next lecture looking at um, yeah, petroleum and gas laws um, the environmental protection act um, is relevant uh, it it operates typically in tandem with the mineral resources act it deals with environmental impacts of a mining project so an environmental authority is required since so both the mineral resources act and the environmental protection act didn't have uh, any significant planning framework um, and that meant that a lot of you know an example like the new Ackland mine is, is a great example of it how mines can occur in high value agricultural land and um, a mine when you weigh up the the positives and negatives a mine might be more valuable um, in immediate dollar terms than keeping it as good quality agricultural land uh, but for the long-term benefit of the state um, maintaining its um, farmland is crucial so there was a real really big pushback by far the farming sector against mining and petroleum development impacting on um, agricultural land so the state government enacted the regional planning interest act in 2014 which is basically um, bringing in a planning a bit of a planning framework to protect agricultural land from mining and petroleum development that's it sort of sits in between um, the mineral resources and petroleum sorry an environmental protection act regime which are very discretionary don't have plans and the planning framework under the um, planning act which um, has lots of you know colorful maps and all these provisions regulating what can go where so the regional planning interest act is sort of like the planning framework but for the mining sector so you can think of it in that way it's not entirely logical but that's the reality the system isn't entirely logical often it's dealt it you know we get to the system we've got through often artifacts of history it's the legacy of previous legislation and previous approaches so the separation between the mining regime and the planning regime is an artifact really of the history of how the law developed in queensland uh, and elsewhere similar 
So in Queensland, mining was given for the last century. Mining's been given a lot of um, assistance, had been given special laws where landholders couldn't stop mines coming in. It was seen as in the interests of the state to develop the mineral resources. So there was a whole system set up to allow tenures to be granted over um, land and then the minerals developed from it. And that whole regime developed for a century. It's only really the last, say, 40 years that we've had significant planning um, controls statewide in Queensland. So the planning regime comes late and is still separate from really the mining regime in, in large part. And the Regional Planning Interest Act is this sort of new component, new kid on the block. It's unclear at this stage how much of a difference it will make. Um, I haven't really seen it making a difference at this point. And you know, when you look at the stage three application for the New Ackland mine uh, and the fact that this obviously piecemeal application has been accepted for assessment under the Regional Planning Interest Act, it doesn't um, build confidence that the new act is actually going to make much difference at all. Um, also in this list of legislation is the State Development Public Works Organisation Act. It was created in 1971 and it copied the US had at that stage just created uh, a term and a process for environmental impact statements. So Queensland copied that framework uh, and created an EIS process in the State Development Public Works Organisation Act. That act also establishes the Coordinator General, which is a um, public office that a person is appointed to, and their job is basically to promote uh, large developments in Queensland. So it's a, a clear conflict of interest um, that the EIS process is given to that person and the Coordinator General's office established under the act to administer the EIS process. But that's the system we've got. And so if large projects typically apply to be made a what's now called a coordinated project under the State Development and Public Works Organisation Act, the New Ackland Stage 3 project was um, declared to be, um, was a significant project when it was declared. That was the term that was used. And then that was changed to call it a coordinated project. So it essentially gets the coordinator general helping it through the process. So and promoting it within government. So that's the State Development Public Works Organisation Act, not a separate approval process. The EIS that's done under it typically feeds back into other uh, application processes under the Mineral Resources Act, the Environmental Protection Act, and things like the Regional Planning Interests Act, as well as the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act, which is the last bit of legislation on that list. And I just mentioned uh, it's federal law, it, um, provides triggers for projects that are going to impact on what are called matters of national environmental significance. And included in that is um, mines that have a significant impact on water resources. So the stage three um, proposal for the new Ackland mine was uh, assessed under the EPBC Act. And we'll talk about that um, in a moment. So can I just summarize that list with this little tree diagram. And this is uh, from an appendix in my book, uh, Synopsis of the Queensland Environmental Legal System. So in when you look at all of the laws in Queensland dealing with mining and petroleum, there's a whole heap that deal with offshore mining and petroleum. But those offshore laws virtually never get used because in Queensland, back in the 1970s, uh, the community in, was very concerned about protecting the Great Barrier Reef and it enacted laws in the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Act in 1975, prohibiting any exploration or development of minerals or petroleum in the Great Barrier Reef area. And that covers most of the Queensland coastline. So for most of the Queensland coastline, mining petroleum is off limits. And in the other areas, it simply hasn't been developed. So the offshore laws are there, but you don't need to be you know you don't need to know much about them because they're never they're never really used if we look then just at the onshore development uh, and look at it in this way um, any land within a protected area such as a national park which is now about eight percent of queensland that is developments prohibited under the nature conservation act so about eight percent of queensland you can't mine um, outside of national parks then there's two big splits there's 
um, basically development other than mining and petroleum, that's all regulated under the Planning Act, and we've dealt with that in earlier lectures. So most, you know, urban development, all of those things are dealt with under the Planning Act. Mining and petroleum gets its own special regime, and there's three components now to that regime. There's the land access, tenure, and royalty issues, and that's regulated under the, for mining under the Mineral Resources Act, for petroleum under the Petroleum and Gas Production Safety Act that we'll talk about in the next lecture. There's also common provisions under the Mineral and, Mineral and Energy Resources Common Provisions Act dealing with compensation and um, overlapping tenures. So that's land access, tenure and royalty issues. Environmental issues are generally dealt with under the Environmental Protection Act. And then there's this new act, as I said, dealing with regional interests, but particularly protecting farmland. Uh, that's the Regional Planning Interests Act 2014. So that little hierarchy, I hope, is helpful for you. I know that the system is, is confusing. Uh, that's the reality of it. So let's look at the applications needed to gain government approval for um, stage three in particular. So if we look at the Mineral Resources Act and just work through it, I just want to highlight a few key provisions. You don't need to know the details of the Act, just basically the basics about tenure and royalties is enough for us. So um, I've already mentioned that mining and petroleum activities are accepted development under the Planning Act. But the key question is, well, what is mining and petroleum? Because it's actually not as straightforward as you might think. So the Mineral Resources Act makes it an offence to do mining without a tenement under the um, under the Act, so there's your offence provision. So I'm, I'm not going and downloading the Mineral Resources Act from the um, state government website. We've done that um, before. You, um, I don't need to go through it. So let's just say we've gone and found the, the law and we were looking, looking through for relevant provisions applying to um, Stage 3. We find that there's an offence to you know, carry out the Stage 3 operations unless we have the mining tenement. So that then forces us into the application process under the Mineral Resources Act um, if what we're doing is mining. So basically mining is defined as extracting a mineral and then you go and look for what is a mineral and you find that it's very vaguely and abstractly defined in subsection, sorry, in section 6 where it says a mineral is a substance normally occurring naturally as part of the Earth's crust. If you think about that, that's any dirt. So if it's, you know, just any dirt in your back garden, is that a mineral? And you know that in normal dirt, there's, you know, metals like lead and things like that. So if you dig in your garden, are you carrying out mining? Well, the answer is no, um, because what you're doing, you're not, you're, you're not doing it for the purposes of um, obtaining a mineral. Um, the... Um, definition of mineral excludes, you see there in subsection 3D, um, soil, sand, gravel or rock if it is to be used or supplied for use not for its mineral properties. So if you're digging up in your back garden, you dig up a garden bed and you're you know, digging out earth, so there's sand, gravel and rock in it, um, but you're not using it for its mineral properties, so you're not mining, basically. Um, one little... Um, uh, provision, I, I just note that's um, I've been caught up by before and I just mentioned it, which is subsection 2K, rock mined in block or slab form for building a monumental purpose is, is defined as including a mineral. So um, that's uh, a good example of that is the um, Great Court at University of Queensland. So sandstone, that's um, cut up in big blocks, the sandstone blocks, those are regarded as a mineral. So most of the sandstone uh, in University of Queensland comes from um, near Ipswich in the Helladon Hills. And so the, that is, if you wanted to apply for a sandstone um, operation in the Helladon Hills, you would be under the Mineral Resources Act. You wouldn't be applying under the planning regime because what you are seeking to do is um, to take out a mineral as defined under the Mineral Resources Act. So even though you might, you know, you look at a sandstone block and you think, well, is that a mineral? 
It is for the purposes of the law because it comes within the definition of mineral under the Mineral Resources Act. But the legal definition of mineral doesn't reflect actually the scientific and technical definition. So the definition of a mineral typically in geological um, in science or geology is that it's naturally occurring, stable at room temperature, represented by a chemical formula, usually abiotic, so it's not the resulting from the activity of living organisms and has an ordered atomic arrangement. So coal comes from um, you know, a fossilised plants, so it doesn't come within the definition of mineral in geology. Um, minerals uh, are extensive. There's 4,900 known mineral species. So things like pyrite, shown up there in the top right, uh, native gold, uh, and those other things, uh, amethyst uh, and the like. If you've you know, been into a crystal shop, then you know, you're, you're often looking at um, minerals. So there have been um, several proposals to change um, the technical definition of mineral to consider um, biogenic or amorphous substances uh, as minerals. Uh, so there have been proposals to include things um, more broadly than just the crystalline things. Um, but under many scientific and technical definitions, coal is still not considered a mineral because it's a rock that's formed from decayed plants and animals, whereas minerals are described as being inorganic. So coal is basically a sedimentary rock formed by fossilised plants. I was interested in this a few years ago because for years I just assumed coal was a mineral and then when I became aware well it doesn't actually come within the scientific definition of mineral I, I went and asked um, uh, a lovely uh, lecturer at uh, University of Queensland and the School of Earth and Environmental Sciences Talitha Santini who teaches uh, our mining um, courses and uh, she said yes well strictly speaking coal is not a mineral um, but it's often treated as a mineral for reporting purposes. So despite our coal arguably not being a mineral in a strict technical sense, in a legal sense it is clear that coal is included as a mineral under the Mineral Resources Act. So if, you are, uh, if there is an operation that is seeking to um, take out coal from the ground to be burned or for coking coal or for steaming coal then, or for other uses of coal, then you are seeking to take out a mineral and you require a mining um, lease. So there's different, so the basic point with that is um, if you're seeking to obtain a mineral from the ground, you're under the mineral regime, um, you can have things, if you're not seeking uh, to use earth or rock for its mineral properties, let's just say you've got a quarry that you're taking out hard rock uh, that is going to be broken up and then um, used for instance to for bitumen on a road or something like that or in construction so you're not using the earth and rock there for its mineral properties so those sorts of operations are dealt with under the planning regime in Queensland so under the um, Mineral Resources Act there's different types of tenures the yeah the MRA is mainly concerned with mining tenure and royalty issues just before I get into that I might just take a pause and uh, if you're listening at um, you can also take a pause and uh, yeah, come back. we'll come back in five minutes. So welcome back to... Welcome back to our lecture on the mining regime in Queensland, Environmental Impact Assessment. Just before we broke, we were talking about the different tenures under the Mineral Resources Act. So the MRA is mainly concerned with mining tenure and royalty issues. So. I'll just work through them. There's several mining tenures that are for basically artisanal or hobby mining tenures. I won't use the term small scale mining activity because that's a term defined under the Environmental Protection Act for a particular thing. But effectively, these are smaller mines or smaller mining activities. And these tenures are associated with them. So not for the New Ackland Stage 3, but um, prospecting permit. Uh, entitles the holder to prospect and uh, for handheld um, minerals, so excluding coal, peg out a mining lease or mining claim, uh, etc. So really small scale stuff, mainly handheld mining. So 
Mining Claim is also a small scale operations with limited use of machinery and can be up to one hectare in area. So way too small for what's proposed for stage three. Also just mentioned there's fossicking licenses under the Fossicking Act as well. So they're all small scale mining related activities or minerals. The large mining tenures are these there's three of them an exploration permit is issued for basically exploring for minerals it might cover a large area and it essentially allows a company to go in and search for minerals and it ex can exclude others from from uh, applying for mining tenures in that area so it gives it rights and there's an obligation to get in and explore um, for you've got to use it basically you can't just hold these and exclude others so exploration doesn't allow you to extract the something like coal and for commercial sale you can only you know do extraction for the purposes of exploration so stage three uh, you have to go beyond the exploration permit mineral development license uh, or mdl is uh, a sort of in-between holding pattern between exploring and actually pulling the coal out of the ground or the mineral you can have a mineral development license which allows mining feasibility studies etc it excludes other miners from lodging applications for mining leases so let's just say you've explored you found this coal but some of it's not economic to develop yet or it's you've got too much and you can't develop it all in one go you might have an mdl and then a mining lease actually allows mining operations and the production of minerals using machines for sale so mining lease is the really important tenure so just to work through them, this is an example of uh, exploratory drilling for coal for the Wondowan coal mine in this image. So basically your drill rig goes down, you drill down, drill down a long way, you pull out a core and look at that core for what's down beneath the ground. And in this image you can see obviously coal uh, or shaley sort of um, materials with layers like uh, here you can see uh, a clay. So here there's you know a layer of clay or something silt uh, and in between um, are, are more coal related uh, seams so here's just another example of um, exploration works you can see there's a fair bit of clearing around the rig see in the background here so in exploration there might be a fair bit of um, damage in terms of clearing vegetation clearing pads uh, doing the work but it's still relatively limited in exploration permits there can also be bulk sampling pits so this is a bulk sampling pit done under an exploration permit for a mine called the Wondowan coal mine and it's a pretty big pit I went out there as part of a court hearing about this proposed mine you can see the obvious um, coal measures there they're quite close to the surface and then here's the overburden so the earth on top of them so this open cut mine proposed to dig down take off the overburden and get down to the coal seams this is another example of a bulk sampling pit for another mine uh, called the Alpha Coal Mine. So a pretty big pit. And if we go down, you can see in the pit here, there's a little um, red thing. That's the excavator. So the next image is basically taken looking at this corner of the pit. So here's that excavator. And you can see the overburden up here. And then the coal seams. Um, there's actually a series of different seams here. The white, I believe, is one of the aquifers that's not a coal seam uh, it was one of the aquifers that was to be impacted by this mine that was a subject of a court case about the uh, proposed mine the alpha coal mine in, in that case but yeah down underneath the white layer was um, a number of the coal seams that the mine in that case was targeting okay so under an exploration permit there's a range of rights that a permit holder has and essentially they can go onto land and explore for minerals so do that sort of drilling those sorts of things you also can exclude others from um, from mining or lodging a mining lease application for that area so basically if you spend a lot of money doing the exploration you don't want others to come in and work you know take all the money you know you found a mineral um, by having an exploration permit it locks in your ability to hold others out from that area for applying for a mining lease so that's a major advantage of it in addition to giving you access then an mdl is granted and there's a big mdl for the um, ackland coal mine stretching really to the south of so this is the mdl boundaries here you can see the existing 
uh, stage two pits shown here. So this is stages one and two mining leases. In the stage one mining lease is in red. The blue is the stage two mining lease. And then the MDL that the mining company holds covers, you know, there's the proposed pits which are in this sort of region. Those are all the proposed pits for stage three. So it's got an MDL over the over that land and it stops other companies coming in and say lodging, you know, another company can't come in and say, well, we want a mining lease in this um, location. Uh, the MDL means that uh, the miner in this, that operates New Ackland coal mine can stop someone doing that. This is an open cut coal pit um, in uh, another mine, not not um, the New Ackland mine. This one is in um, near Blackwater in central Queensland, the Kara coal mine. And uh, the point, the, the tenure that we go on to um, from an MDL is the mining lease. And to do this sort of operation, to, to extract coal for uh, and then sell it, you require a mining lease. So holders of expiration permits can restrict the grant of mining leases in the area. So um, that's dealt with under the Mineral Resources Act. You don't need to know the details of it, just that the different tenures give you different rights. And uh, if you go on to apply for a mining lease, that's the key um, tenure that you need to extract a significant amount of minerals for sale. So the grant of a mining lease you apply for, the process is, um, on paper, it's pretty straightforward. There's objections. Anyone can object to the grant of a mining lease. I just would note at this point that because the mining lease application for stage three of the New Ackland mine was made prior to amendments in 2016, it requires an associated water license under the Water Act um, with objection rights and potential hearing in the land court. But uh, are any applications after 2016 Groundwater impacts of mining applications are being assessed automatically under the Environmental Protection Act uh, and Mineral Resources Act. And a holder of a mining lease that's granted um, will have an automatic water entitlement under a section called 334ZP of the Mineral Resources Act gives an entitlement to use groundwater. But for the New Ackland coal mine, stage three, it still requires an associated water license. I'm not going to spend time though looking at that um, because for most mines and for your careers going forward, uh, it will, they, will, they will generally be dealt with under um, the Environmental Protection Act and you won't require an additional uh, water uh, license or an associated water license. Um, mines prior to 2016 um, had um, water licenses uh, generally for interfering with groundwater. So uh, that's the 10 years under the Mineral Resources Act. And the main thing to be aware of is, okay, expiration permit for exploring, um, mining lease for actually mining. They're the two major 10 years you need. So going on from that, environmental authorities under the Environmental Protection Act are linked to those 10 years. So the Environmental Protection Act is a complex bit of legislation. It's undergone significant amendments over time. You can download it and have a look at it. We'll talk more about the general offence provisions in a later lecture, lecture seven. We talk about environmental harm, but my, and it regulates um, things called environmentally relevant activities uh, in, in addition to general offences for environmental harm. So the old structure, so the Act's undergone a whole series of amendments over the 20 years of its existence. And prior to 2013, it had a series of um, chapters dealing with the different approval processes under it. After 2013, those were consolidated into Chapter 5 dealing with environmental authorities uh, and environmentally relevant activities. And um, there's other provisions, but we'll, I want to focus on the environmental authorities component of the Environmental Protection Act. So as we've done in um, earlier lectures when we're looking through an act and remember we talked about the the main uh, if you're thinking you know doing statutory interpretation your first step is to find the laws um, relevant to your problem then skim read them and identify the relevant bits and then interpret those bits uh, according to ordinary meaning read in context well if we skim read this 
looking for an offence for mining without an approval, we'd find um, section 426 says that a person mustn't carry out an ERA, an environment of irrelevant activity, unless the person holds or is acting under an environmental authority. So that forces us to go and get an environmental authority if we uh, are carrying out an ERA. So ERA is defined by reference to um, prescribed activities under the regulations, as well as resource activities and agricultural ERAs. So under the um, Act, the new Chapter 5 deals with all of those ERAs, but the prescribed ERAs are integrated into the um, planning regime. So if you, for instance, aquaculture and intensive animal industry is one of the prescribed ERAs under um, the Environmental Protection Regulations and uh, the now Environmental Protection Regulations 2018, it should be updated. So the regulations have changed since um, I created that original slide. Um, but um, aquaculture and intensive animal industry is still a prescribed ERA. And if you wanted to apply for, say, an aquaculture facility, you would make your application under the Planning Act and you'd go through the DA system. And uh, one of the state level triggers would be that you're carrying out an ERA. So you would, you know, you'd normally make the application to the local government and you would also have a referral to the um, SARA, the State Assessment Referral Agency, and that would be assessed then for the ERA component of it under the Environmental Protection Act, and then the referral response would go back from SARA to the local government imposing any conditions that the Department of Environment and Science wanted to impose. And then the Department of Environment and Science would effectively regulate um, the activity at a state level. So um, mining activities um, are a resource activity that requires an environmental authority under the um, Environmental Protection Act. So they're, they're different to a prescribed ERA. They've got their own framework uh, and it's linked to the 10 years under the Mineral Resources Act and also for um, petroleum uh, activity as well. So for mining, uh, an activity that is an authorized activity for a mining tenement under the Mineral Resources Act is a mining activity. And so you require a um, environmental authority to do that under the Environmental Protection Act as well. But can you see how it's linked? So if you get uh, an activity approved by a mining lease under the Mineral Resources Act, then by definition, it also requires an environmental authority under the Environmental Protection Act. So the two are interlinked. And they were separated. It's got a complicated history, but the idea was um, uh, a couple of decades ago to to basically separate out the administration and regulation of and the promotion of mining would be dealt with by the Mines Department under the Mineral Resources Act and the regulation of mining would be dealt with by the Department of Environment under the Environmental Protection Act. So there was an attempt to avoid conflicts of interest in regulation and that's really the reason why we've got two uh, bits of legislation dealing with, with mining in different ways in Queensland. So. Uh, it's an offence to carry out uh, an a ERA or a mining activity without an environmental authority under the Act, so you require an approval. There's a definition of small-scale mining activity in Schedule 4, which is yeah, really small stuff. Um, so Section 426 doesn't apply to a small-scale activity. We're not doing an, e an agricultural ERA. So the Stage 3 of um, New Ackland um, basically is caught by this provision we're not small scale and therefore we have to go th undergo the assessment process in chapter 5 of the environmental protection act and there's four stages to it application information notification and decision stage so very similar to the da system under the planning act and there's a difference though to the planning act framework is that there's three types of uh, ERA applications. They're called standard, variation, and site-specific. Standard basically is when an application meets the eligibility criteria in terms of disturbance area, location, basically the, the, the smaller impact activities uh, you'd expect to be standard applications. They're relatively low risk, and so they're standard applications that get standard conditions. Vari 
variation applications are sort of in between where you don't quite meet the eligibility criteria you need to change the standard conditions that's called a variation application but the big mines get site-specific applications so New Ackland um, Stage 3 is a site-specific application. It undergoes the full process, including public notification and objection rights under the, um, the um, Environmental Protection Act. I should mention that because in this case, because the um, just one layer of complexity in this is that because the um, mine Stage 2 had an existing environmental authority, the miner applied to amend its existing environmental authority to um, to basically authorize stage three, and that amendment process, because it was um, so such a substantial amendment, it goes through effectively the whole process again as a normal like a an application, a clean application for a new ERA or a new mining activity, but technically the stage three application was an amendment application. That undergoes the same process under chapter 5 though okay so that's the environmental protection act main thing to be aware of is they're linked they require you require an environmental authority for mining activities and um, there's a process set out in chapter 5 and conditions can be attached uh, other act that i want to mention is the regional planning interest act 2014 which i've already talked about earlier um, but i'll just summarize again so this act came in uh, quite a, a bit into the process for assessing stage three of the um, New Ackland mine. It uh, requires a regional interest development approval and it's principally about ensuring that resource activities such as mines and calcium gas are assessed against the regional, the plans created under um, the Act. So the Act principally protects priority agricultural areas, strategic cropping areas, priority living areas, and strategic environmental areas. But it's mainly about protecting yeah, um, farmland, particularly from um, mining and coal seam gas activities. That's what it was responding to. So if we look at the proposed mine, uh, and you can go onto um, the state government um, website and you get an image like this. I've got a circle there is where West Pit is. The background is just showing 10 years. All of it is shown as a priority agricultural area. So the whole of the mine and all to the south is a priority agricultural area under the uh, Act. Um, also, again, I've just circled in red where West Pit is, but all of that green area is a strategic cropping area under the Act. And then this is just a different um, mapping tool showing um, the um, strategic cropping land trigger. So that's... Uh, the, the area that we're looking at for West Pit as well as um, Stage 3 triggers the uh, Environmental, sorry, the Regional Planning Interest Act. Uh, I mentioned earlier that the mine has been pretty tricky. The mine has been pretty tricky in how it's doing its application. My view is it's a piecemeal application. It's not applied really for what Stage 3 involves. You can see there that the Stage 3 pits, they've chopped off West Pit, they've chopped off the bottom of sorry, Manningvale West Pit, and they've chopped off a bit of Willaroo Pit, but also they've left out from their application the coal handling and processing plant. Um, so trucks are going to drive across to the coal handling processing plant with coal and then go down to the rail link. So all of those things have been left out from the application. So in my view, it shouldn't be regarded as a proper uh, application, but the department uh, administering this ap appears to have accepted it and is and is assessing it on the basis that the mining company has put it forward. In my view, it's, it's not a valid application. Um, but I don't want to spend more time on the Regional Planning Interest Act. I spent long enough on the legislation. I'm sure you're thinking, gosh, is there any more? Well, there is a couple more things that I just need to deal with. Uh, the thing I want to deal with, um, just the last bits of legislation, are the State Development and Public Works Organisation Act 1971 mentioned before that this provides an environmental impact statement process for coordinated projects. They were previously called significant projects. So stage three of the um, New Ackland mine was declared a significant project back in 2007 or 2009. When that terminology changed, it's now called a coordinated project. And that means it basically gets the assistance of the Coordinator General's Office. The Coordinator General is a 
statutory office uh, that's created under the State Development Public Works Organisation Act um, sits within the Department of State Development Infrastructure and Planning. I just wanted to mention at this point, uh, as you know, part of our course, uh, I wanted to mention environmental impact assessment um, basics because uh, in EIA is an important component of lots of laws in lots of different ways. So environmental impact assessment, formal EIA uh, is widely used around the world. One of the most common forms of EIA is the preparation of an environmental impact statement or an EIS. It was first used and that term was created by the National Environmental Policy Act in 1969 in the US. And then many countries have copied that terminology. So you'll commonly hear about an EIS for a project. It's a form of environmental impact assessment. Um, the basic purpose of EIA is to inform decision makers and the public of the true impacts of a proposal and allow alternatives and mitigation measures to be weighed up. So that's basically what you're trying to do. In Queensland, there's three EIS pro processes that can be used. Uh, the, at a federal level, there's, the, there's an EIS process under the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act. There's also the State Development Public Works Organisation Act and the Environmental Protection Act also has an EIS process. For any large mines, it's typically the EIS process that's used is the State Development and Public Works Organisation Act. And that's then used um, for the assessment under the Environmental Protection Act and for the assessment at a federal level under the EPBC Act. But the e EIS occurs under the State Development and Public Works Organisation Act. So normally only one is used. So in my synopsis book, I've um, put in one of the appendixes this little flowchart and it shows the basic process for an EIS under the State Development Public Works Organisation Act. The proponent applies and if the coordinator general thinks the project is big enough to warrant um, their assistance, it's declared a coordinated project. Terms of reference for the EIS um, are finalised. The proponent and its consultants prepare the EIS. That's publicly notified and people can make submissions about the EIS and say you know what they think about the project. Then normally there's a supplementary EIS is prepared. So you normally talk about the EIS and then the supplementary EIS by the proponent dealing with the comments from the public. And at the end of all of that, the coordinator general gives a report recommending approval, typically very rarely recommends a refusal of a project. So the coordinator general clearly um, has a bias for large scale development my view they shouldn't be in charge of the EIS process in doing this report but that's the system we've got. That's the EIS process under the State Development and Public Works Organisation Act um, as a flowchart and if you look at the basics of you know the basic flowchart for an application for a mine it looks pretty simple so the application for a mining lease and environmental authority then if you apply also for a coordinated project, you do an EIS under the State Development Public Works Organisation Act as a second step. Then there's objections, um, both under the EIS process, but also under the Mining Legislation and Environmental Protection Act after the EIS is done. Then often, if in a controversial project, there'll be an objection hearing in the land court, and then the, the land court makes a recommendation and it goes on for ministerial approval uh, and approval by the Department of Environment and Science under the Environmental Protection Act. So that's broadly the process and it looks, okay, well that looks simple, but the actual reality is really complex. So this is a flowchart from um, a, a mine that I was involved with um, litigation about a few years ago. The Alpha Coal Mine, I showed you a few pictures of the test pit for it that was out in the Galilee Basin. And it, it started in 2008 under the State Development Public Works Organisation Act. It was declared a significant project. There was terms of reference, the whole EIS was prepared. So everything under the timeline is at a state level. And then at a federal level, it was also assessed under the EPBC Act, but they used the um, EIS process under the State Development Public Works Organisation Act, um, which comprises all of these steps for um, the assessment and then the EPBC Act approval was granted in 2012. So four years it was being assessed under the EPBC Act. 
but years of that assessment was taken up with the EIS. And then there was an objection hearing in the land court um, and the environmental authority was ultimately issued in 2014. The mining lease has never been granted for that project because it effectively became unviable um, due to the, the changes in the outlook for coal. Um, so that project never got a mining lease, but that's just an illustration of the factual complexity of these uh, application processes. I've mentioned the EPBC Act. Uh, I'm going to deal with that more in Lecture 10, but I'll just mention it now for completeness. So it's a federal legislation that gives a series of triggers called Matters of National Environmental Significance. There's nine of them broadly. The stage three of the New Ackland mine was referred under the Act. It was found to be a controlled action for two controlling provisions, um, listed threatened species and listed threatened ecological communities, which is section 18 and 18 capital A of the Act. And as a mine that would have a significant impact on water resources under sections 24D and 24E. So those are called the controlling provisions. It means that the action has to be assessed under the EPBC Act. It was assessed um, because the Act creates a system whereby state um, EIS processes can be used um, for the assessment. So it set up a system called assessment um, bilateral agreements. There's two types. Assessment bilaterals allow state um, EIA procedures to be substituted for EIA procedures under the EPBC Act, but the Commonwealth retains the ultimate decision. And then approval bilaterals would allow the state to make the ultimate decision under the federal laws. And approval bilaterals have been very controversial. There was a push for them a few years ago, but effectively there's only assessment bilaterals. In Queensland, um, there is an assessment bilateral. It lists three EIS processes, including still, it hasn't been updated. It's still got the Sustainable Planning Act. That was never really used. The Environmental Protection Act is very rarely used. Um, it's basically always uses the State Development Public Works Organisation Act or one of the other assessment procedures under the EPBC Act. So if there's an EIS prepared for a big mine, it'll typically be done under the State Development and Public Works Organisation Act, and that's then used fed into the federal level approval. And again, in that, um, the appendixes to the synopsis book and, and the handout I've got for this lecture, um, I've done a flow chart for assessment under the EPBC Act. I'll come back to that in lecture 10. So whew, that's a long, um, I'm sure you're, you're pretty worn out. There's all of those laws that apply to this mine. Isn't that complicated? Well, yes. The reality is it's very complicated and there's a lot of different assessment and objection rights. And for most mines, a lot of these things are not controversial because, you know, most mines in the Bowen Basin, there's not, not a lot of people live there. Um, mining is well established in the area. They generally, a lot of mines go through very quickly without any objections. But for this mine, because it's surrounded by um, farmers in close proximity, it's such high value agricultural land, there's a lot of people around it it's faced a whole heap of objections and it's got a lot of problems um, associated with its location. Most mines don't have anywhere near this level of um, objections and problems. So if we go on and think, so stage three needs all of these um, approvals, are those applications likely to be granted? And just want to look at, well, how are mines assessed? So talked about this basic process um, but how do we get at the approval stage the Minister for Mines makes the decision about the mining lease and the Department of Environment makes the decision on the environmental authority. Under the mining lease the Minister has to consider a number of matters listed in 2694 of the Act and they're the criteria and those include whether the provisions of the Act have been complied with in relation to public notification and the like but importantly, um, J, K are two really important criteria, whether there will be any adverse environmental impact caused by the mine, and also whether the public right and interest will be prejudiced by the mine. So those are two broad criteria that are considered, but there's no maps uh, attached to the assessment typically. So you're assessing, okay, well, are the environmental impacts acceptable? And the public, in, when you're looking at assessing the public interest, you're weighing up all of the benefits of the mine, like jobs and royalties and the like, 
versus the costs. So the environmental impacts, the noise to neighbors, all of those things. And you weigh them up. And if you think that the benefits outweigh the costs, then you'd conclude that a project is in the public interest and therefore should be supported. And similarly with environmental impacts, a mine like this, there's going to be environmental impacts. You're really asking, well, is it, are these reasonable? Are they acceptable within the objects of the act? And so uh, when you're assessing an environmental authority under the Environmental Protection Act, there's similar considerations. There's a broad objective of ecologically sustainable development. There's an obligation on persons um, uh, exercising powers under the act to seek to achieve that object or exercise the power in the way that best achieves the object of the act. So those are broad obligations to basically use your powers to achieve ESD. Then the criteria for deciding applications uh, basically are linked to something called the standard criteria, which are listed in the dictionary of the act and include principles like um, things set out, um, precautionary principle, inter intergenerational equity and the like, but also things like the public interest and the character, resilience and values of the receiving environment. So again, there's a broad criteria. There's no real map attached to it. There's no way of saying, okay, you can't have this a mine here because uh, this, is, this land's set aside for nature conservation. Uh, so yeah, there's this act gives broad criteria for weighing up the, the costs and benefits within the context of achieving ESD, but it's still a broad discretionary criteria. And that's quite different to the planning framework. Um, so applications for mines are rarely rejected. It can happen. So the new Ackland coal mine, the, the massive mine that was proposed in 2012 was rejected. That's exceptional. Um, the the revised mine, though, has um, been approved um, at a state government level. We're still waiting for a mine. Well, the miner still needs a mining lease, which is um, presumably waiting on the outcome of the High Court um, proceedings. But um, it's got its environmental authority for stage three at this stage. Um, mines are rarely rejected. This news article was from 2014 with the state government of the time, which had rejected um, a, a mine because of it didn't, um, uh, because of the um, commitments that um, hadn't been made to the traditional owners of the area. And anyway, that doesn't preclude the application, you know, being reapplied for going forward in different ways. But anyway, that was uh, and one of the exceptions as well. Most mines that are applied for get approved. Because when you weigh up the broad discretionary criteria, my, uh, jobs and royalties typically trump environmental impacts. So, so to answer our key questions, does West Pitt and the proposed stage three of the New Ackland coal mine need any approvals to comply with the law? And are those approvals likely to be granted? Well, yes, um, I, we'd say West Pitt, uh, if you say West Pitt um, wasn't authorized by the original stage two approval, it should have undergone an application process. It hasn't. Therefore, uh, on that basis, it's unlawful. The proposed stage three, uh, other than you know, the mine, it, West Pit is part of was part of stage three, but mine is now you know calling it part of stage two. Um, but the the other parts of stage three uh, are still undergoing many approval processes. Um, the mining lease is still yet to be granted. It's got its environmental authority. It needs to still gain the regional interest development uh, approval. Um, and it also needs an associated water license because of the quirk of the transitional provisions for um, water licenses and assessing groundwater. So are those approvals likely to be granted? Well, all of them ultimately involve a pretty broad weighing up of costs versus benefits. And yeah, the reality is that in the weighing up process, jobs and econo economics typically trump other considerations. So, uh, and, and typically, you know, you can quantify the amount of money you'll make, you can quantify the number of jobs, but the environmental impacts are qualitative only. You know, you think, well, there will be some impacts to groundwater, the extent of which is uncertain, uh, impacts to biodiversity, the extent of which is uncertain, uh, they're generally quite qualitative, the costs, whereas the, yeah, the, the dollars that you get and the jobs are quantified. So 
yes, there is this overarching duty to achieve ESD, but yeah, jobs and economics trump social and environmental impacts typically. And this statement from the then Queensland Premier, even though his government rejected the broader, um, the, the larger stage three proposal, he was there. They were very, very supportive of the mining sector generally and saying we are in the coal business. If you want decent hospitals, schools and police on the beat, you need to understand that. So that's yeah, basically saying mining, that's what we're about. And this was reflected in a, a really interesting analysis by a, an author called Guy Pearce, wrote a quarterly essay um, back in 2009 called Quarry Vision. And I think he captured a, a really important um, point by saying Australian politicians have quarry vision. They believe Australia's greatest asset is its mineral and energy resources, coal above all. And this distorts our national politics and stymies action on climate change. So basically seeing Australia as big yeah, resource pit that we basically have to develop um, you know, for economic prosperity. So that's mainstream um, bipartisan view of both the coalition and labor at a federal and state level uh, in Australia. So yeah, huge support for the coal industry. And that leads on then to the final couple of topics I just wanted to um, wrap up in this lecture. And that is an important topic for environmental regulation overall, which is regulatory capture, which is a huge problem, a huge problem for environmental regulation. So there's a whole heap of work in this area. Regulatory capture is a concept and organizational theory and government um, policy, a great a book was written about it in Australia, a great study by Peter Grabowski and John Braithwaite back in 1986. The book was called Of Manners, Manners Gentle, Enforcement Strategies of Australian Business Regulatory Agencies. And these authors went around to different business regulators around Australia and they looked at their attitudes to enforcement and they basically found that Australian business regulatory agency, agencies are very gentle. They don't litigate. They basically think... Um, litigation is a matter of last resort so they don't like to enforce laws uh, against business and the mining sector is just you know an aspect of the business sector and in Queensland specifically the major agencies in Queensland dedicated to environmental regulation basically took an explicit avoidance of prosecution in favor of a tolerant tolerant conciliary approach so that was in the 1980s uh, and in that time in Queensland we had a government called the Bjorka Peterson government at the state level in 1989, there was a massive inquiry called the Fitzgerald Inquiry, which found widespread corruption in the police and in government in Queensland. It led to, you know, it was a massive scandal, massive inquiry. It led to Fitzgerald reforms dealing with corruption, particularly in government. Um, in the 1990s, we then, you know, passed acts like the, the Environmental Protection Act, and this was the wave of new environmental laws that came in as part of a global push for sustainable development and concern about the environment. So that wave came through and, and the environment department um, was you know, part, part and parcel with those reforms. But we still have this attitude that you know, we're in the coal business. And at a federal level, this is our prime minister, um, saying in 2017, holding up a lump of coal in Parliament, saying, don't be afraid, don't be afraid, don't be scared, it won't hurt you, it's coal. So that was when he was the treasurer. It's no surprise that when politicians are giving this overt support for the sector, that pretty well any application for a coal mine gets approved by um, the public servants uh, operating the laws and ministers. And this was this um, joke, which I also put up in this cartoon uh, I put it up in lecture one it's about the Adani mine which had uh, its federal environmental approval um, set aside because the minister had made an error in the assessment process and the prime minister at the time there was Tony Abbott and he's the fellow holding um, the fellow that looks like a frog was the environment minister and they're pointing at um, the yakka skink which was one of the species that the approval was set aside because of um, incorrect assessment of impacts on the Yakka skink and the Yakka skink is saying ha I understand there's a risk your environmental protection laws may inadvertently protect the environment and the Prime Minister is saying I'm as shocked as you are and yes it's a cartoon but it really captures uh, in a graphic way a, a huge uh, issue for environmental regulation generally which um, it's yeah far from a joke 
um, that most environmental protection laws are basically paper laws. They rarely get enforced. And this has been the subject of study in Queensland. A really good article was written by Michael Brody and Tim Predsler, uh, the enforcement of environmental protection laws in Queensland at case of regulatory capture. It's written in 1998 in the Environmental and Planning Law Journal. And capture theory describes the process by which government agencies responsible for corporate regulation shift from enforcing public interest laws to serving the interests of the corporate entities that are being regulated. So you can have outright corruption, so money being paid to regulators. So that's a form of regulatory capture. But there's, that's, you know, that's the overt form of capture. But there's also far subtler forms, often with uh, things like revolving door, where people that have worked in industry, you know, get a job working for government and vice versa. People who've worked in government get a job working for industry. So there's cycling of the staff. And so the people that in the agency come to have the views that basically they support the sector and that their job isn't to regulate, they're there to help the sector that they're supposed to be regulating. So uh, agency survival can also be a significant factor in appeasing strong interest groups. So regulators can have the view that they can't take on, say, the mining sector because it's too big and powerful politically. So they seek to appease their ministers and the like. And in that context, um, Brody and Presler said, and I think this is a really important um, statement, legislation, that is environmental legislation, may be partly symbolic, designed to satisfy international obligations or to quiet public interest groups with the tacit understanding between government and regulators of under-enforcement. And that is a massive, massive problem uh, for environmental regulations in Australia, but also globally. So regulatory capture theory, it's an important aspect of research into organizational behavior. And in it, the shift is a subtle one in which the attitudes and thinking of those regulated come to prevail um, in the thinking of many of the regulatory officials. That's the subtle one. That's the where there's not outright corruption, but essentially the regulators just start to think we need to protect the industry. We're not there to protect for instance, the neighbors. We want this mine to go ahead. We think it's important for the economy. Um, we yeah we need to have some bells and whistles on it so that we can say we're protecting the neighbours but really they're there to protect the mine. So the reasons um, for grossly inadequate enforcement of environmental laws in Queensland, this is what Brodie and Presler concluded in 1998, must include a notion of partial capture of the Department of Environment and political interference over familiarity and an organisational tradition of under enforcement. Um, reflect that. So I was working for the Department of Environment then in 1998 and 99, and I think that that statement is absolutely accurate. There was a tradition of under-enforcement uh, and the department simply didn't prosecute anyone. Um, so a lot has changed within the Department of Environment. It's now called the Department of Environment and Science. There's, they've got a much better regulatory structure. They've got lawyers. They've got a lot more machinery for prosecutions and they do do some good prosecutions. So there's been a really good prosecution by the Department of Environment and Science of Link Energy running since 2013, big investigation, massive prosecution still ongoing. Uh, and that's been excellent, um, but it's very hit and miss. And when you look at the Ackland coal mine, it's a very different picture. So, um, I'll talk about Link Energy when we look at the Environmental Protection Act, but when we look at the Ackland coal mine, um, it's really hard not to conclude that there is a strong element of regulatory capture in what's occurred. Uh, so this reflects the fact that there's often an enormous gap between what the law says on paper and the reality in practice. For the new Ackland mine, like let's just assume that the department's failure back in 2006 to attach a map of the mine pit areas to the stage two environmental authority was merely an enormous stuff up. Let's just say they completely stuffed it up. It, you can call it negligent. Um, you just Let's just say it was a stuff up rather than regulatory capture, okay? And you then go on to say, well, when we look at it now, that the mining of West Pit is lawful and a prosecution would fail. Let's just say you're the department and that's your assessment. You say that environmental authority, well, we didn't attach a map, therefore the mining company is right. 
they can mine anywhere in their mining lease as long as they comply with the other conditions and we're not going to be able to succeed in a prosecution. Now, I disagree with that, but let's just assume that that's right. It's just a stuff up and we can't do anything about it or we can't prosecute it. The question that I have, and this is where regulatory capture just seems to be the only explanation, is why has the Department of Environment and Science taken no steps since 2015 to amend the Environmental Authority to attach a map of the approved pits and stop West Pit when it clearly has power to do so under the Act? So I'll just take you to the section, section 215, subsection 2N. So under section 215, there is a power for the department to amend um, an environmental authority. A, if the holder of the environmental authority agrees, that's not gonna happen here. The mining company is never going to agree that um, to attaching a map that stops it mining West Pit. But it can do it without consent if any of the matters in um, subsection two are met and there's a procedure for giving notice and the like. But let's just, look at subsection 2, N says that uh, if there's been a significant change in the way in which, sorry, I'll say it slowly, um, the administering authority may invent, amend an environmental authority without consent of the holder of the environmental authority if a significant change in the way in which or the extent to which the activity is being carried out. And there's an example given of the conditions of an environmental authority for a mining activity authorized under a mining lease were imposed on the basis that a particular method for removing contaminants from a waste stream for a relevant mining activity would be used. The mining lease is transferred and the transferee changes the method. So that's an example of when the conditions can be changed. Well, that's exactly what has happened here, basically, except it's not about a change in the method because they're still doing open cut mining. But clearly there's been a significant change in the extent to which the mining is being carried out. So it's crystal clear that the department can make a change uh, and attach a map and they've failed to do so since for, for years now. So the poor landholders who are suffering from noise and dust of this massive West Pit, which never was applied for, it, it's just incredible. So the term regulatory capture is applied to regulators, um, the government, and I think regulatory capture is the, really the only explanation for why the Department of Environment and Science in this case hasn't um, at least changed the conditions to stop West Pit. It's just inexcusable, unexplainable. Uh, if you think that, you know, we want to, we, we're, we're um, regulators and our job is to basically enforce the law this was our stuff up, but we can fix it now. And they haven't used that power. Why not? It's hard to explain other than regulatory capture. So regulatory capture normally is applied to government, but the same or stronger influences affect the private sector as uh, environmental consultants and lawyers, sorry, private sector uh, actors such as environmental consultants and lawyers. So few, if any, private consultants or lawyers speak out uh, against industry interests. You know, the, the common adage is don't bite the hand that feeds you. So this is gonna influence your careers too. So if you work as a consultant in the private sector in the future, who would you wanna work for? Just ask this question. Large mining companies and other developers who can pay your professional fees and who you can expect will be return business, um, you'll get return business from over many years. So, you know, you're in business to stay in business. So this is a big payer of your fees, your professional fees. Um, do you want to work for government? They can also pay your fees, maybe not as well as the mining sector, but they can still pay your fees and they might come back to you. Or do you want to work for members of the community um, and the public who generally cannot pay your fees and you won't expect return business from in the future? So they're the opposition. So if there's a mine proposed and you're a consultancy, will you, who do you want to work for? Well, most consultants want to work for the mining companies. And I've been in many cases where even when um, public interest objectors or community groups can pay some fees, you can't, simply can't get a consultancy. No one will take on your work because no one wants to be seen to be in opposition to the development. 
They don't want to be seen to be opposed to mining, even if they're there as a paid consultant. So they simply won't take on the work. So it's, yeah, it's often a terribly difficult fight for landholders who oppose projects. And yet, you know, the, the miner gets all the consultants, they've got all the money. That then leads me on to the final point that I wanted to make in this lecture, which is what is the, print, the central principle of environmental regulation, law and policy? And this is a good point in our course to think about this. So applications for mines are assessed against broad qualitative criteria, such as whether the approval would be in the public interest and things like ecologically sustainable development, so broad objectives. There are no or very, very few quantitative limits for impacts above which refusal is mandatory. So generally, they ultimately become a weighing up process of cost versus benefits. The dominant political paradigm in Queensland and Australia is that we will mine and burn all available fossil fuels. You get that in this sort of um, exercise from the Prime Minister saying, you know, don't be afraid, don't be scared, it won't hurt you, it's coal. So let's ignore climate change or, or basically we want to develop our whole, all of our coal resources and we've still got a lot of it. We've got a century or so of coal to go. We like to think that environmental policy and decisions are based predominantly on science and evidence, but the reality is many government decisions are highly political and ideological, with claims of being based on science and best available information really used as camouflage. So a recent example of where that camouflage got pulled away uh, wasn't in an environmental context, but there's good lessons in it. This is a uh, ongoing um, scandal at a federal level in Australia, which has been, obviously everything's overtaken at the moment with the coronavirus. Um, but uh, in the background, uh, it's still going on, uh, this scandal about, it's called the sports rorts, um, where there was hundreds of millions of dollars allocated by the federal sports minister, Bridget McKenzie, before she resigned in early February, 2020. And basically she used um, her her office um, used uh, color-coded spreadsheets for app there were applications made for sports grants under this program and basically they looked at different uh, applications and th there was this color-coded spreadsheet identifying whether they were from liberal or national party electorates um, or labor electorates or and the targeted marginal seats so Bridget McKenzie um, was a national party part of the coalition government. So basically they were favoring their own parties and marginal seats and it was used in the campaign for the 2019 Australian federal election. So there's important lessons uh, in this sports rot scandals for environmental law. Ministerial discretion is equally skewed to prove coal mines. We just don't see leaks of color coded spreadsheets to illustrate it. Applications for mines that are assessed against the public interest and ecologically sustainable development um, basically, yeah, it's skewed. Um, so what the law says on paper, such as you have to consider the public interest in approving a mine, the, that's what it says on paper, but the exercise of discretion is what lies beneath the words on the paper. So you see here, I've got a fin. So beneath what you see on the paper, the exercise of discretion are the sharks. So on surface, what the law says on paper, beneath the surface, the exercise of discretion. And so on the surface, the law might state goals like sustainable development and allow a discretion for approval in the public interest. That's what it says on paper. Beneath the surface, there's a strong preference, a culture supporting growth that is unlimited expansion, unlimited, no limits, private profits and money and employment jobs in construction, the mining sector. So if you look at that in the context of the New Ackland coal mine, growth, private profit and employment jobs, that's what gets um, the votes, so to speak, that's what gets the, the political support and the impacts on the surrounding neighbours and farmland is, uh, and groundwater, those sorts of things get pushed right down in the list of priorities. We, we put conditions on them, we call it, we've made a decision based on best available science that's often just bells and whistles to, yeah, to cover a decision which is strongly skewed um, in a biased way. So I think I avoided the word bias there deliberately. Let's just call it a culture of preference. 
um, supporting growth, private profit and employment jobs. That's our culture. So ministers who are politicians often make political decisions, but so do government departments, local governments and independent agencies. So government departments, if you're in government, you know what the government, you know, you see statements from the premier and the prime minister supporting the coal sector. If you're assessing a coal mine, you know the politics around the coal sector. You know that the government wants to support it. If you're assessing it, you're, you're going to probably view your career is going to be limited uh, if you start to say we can't approve this because of climate change or other impacts. You know, you, that's a big call to make if you're in government, um, in a government role. Uh, so often discretions that are given to government um, officers are similarly exercised um, with those, that, those cultural um, preferences. So don't be naive that the law will protect the environment. There's often a big gap between what the law says on paper and how it's implemented. And we live in a culture that strongly supports growth, private profit and jobs. And it should be unsurprising that discretions granted for approvals routinely, routinely favour those things. And that brings me back to Brodie and Presler's statement. Environmental legislation may be partly symbolic, designed to satisfy international obligations or to quiet public interest groups with the tacit understanding between the government and regulators of under enforcement. So that gap between what the law says on paper and what happens in practice is one of the huge challenges, one of the biggest challenges we face in environmental regulation in terms of actually making it work. Yeah, don't be naive, but don't be cynical, be realistic. Um, and in this context, I just want to say, well, or ask, is there a central paradigm or principle in all of this for environmental regulation in Australia? Um, if you look at the laws or a textbook, you'll often see terms like ecologically sustainable development stated as our policy objective. Well, the main central lesson that I've learned in my career is this. Environmental regulation is hard and money talks. Environmental regulation is hard factually and legally and money talks not in the sense of outright corruption. I don't see a lot of evidence in, in that. And I don't suggest that for the New Ackland coal mine that there's outright corruption. Um, I think the regulatory capture in this sense is much subtler. It reflects essentially the culture within the Department of Environment and Science. But money talks in the fact that money buys political influence and resources to buy the best lawyers and experts to support extensive damage to the environment. So the miner in this case has you know, a multi-billion dollar development that it's trying to get approved. It can buy, it can spend tens of millions of dollars on lawyers and experts and see that as a good business investment. For neighbours who are opposed to the mine, there's no pot of gold if they, you know, if they get the mine rejected. There's nothing that they get in, in financial sense, really. They just get essentially to use their land in peace and possibly, you know, less noise and yeah, less noise and dust and less groundwater impacts. But you know, there's no big payday at the end for them. So in terms of the money that they've got to spend to fight the mine, it's a very one sided fight with the mining uh, company having a huge resources, virtually unlimited resources to pursue the applications and basically the people around it um, left um, with you know very very limited resources and our legal system really is based on the assumption that there's a regulator that will actually do its job and get in and assess the environmental impact so that's where the resources would come in to do a proper assessment and you know protect the people around the mine so if that was you know how the system worked then it wouldn't matter so much that there was this real disparity in resources between the mining company and the people that live around the mine because you could rely upon the government to basically do the right thing. But uh, as this problem shows, it's not the case. You need to look at West Pitt. The government isn't doing the right thing at all. They basically left the neighbours, they left them out, out to dry. You know, they just left them swinging in the breeze to use another metaphor. It's just a terrible situation of... I think maladministration by the regulator and it's more widespread than just this mine. I'm just using this mine as a very, very um, graphic example of regulatory capture and failure in environmental regulation in Queensland, but also nationally. 
Okay, financial resources that are that large mining companies and other developers wield puts them at a great practical advantage to people in the community who oppose a mine or other large project proceeding. And financial resources gives them the, the ability to outgun the community um, with lawyers and paid consultants. That's the lecture for today. Uh, focused on the New Ackland coal mine, work through the legislation. It is very complex, but uh, that's reality. In, you don't have to, but if you want to look at the complexity um, of the application process and some of the documents, you can look at the EIA documents on the case study on my website. The take-home points from this lecture are, this, are these. Mining petroleum is accepted development under the Planning Act, therefore the DA system doesn't apply to them. The definitions of mineral and petroleum are the keys to understanding what activities are exempt from the Planning Act. So if you are if your activity is to extract a mineral or petroleum, then you don't require approval under the Planning Act. You require approval under the mineral and the petroleum regimes. There's different regimes exist at a state level for tenure and royalties versus environmental protection, mining versus petroleum, and onshore and offshore activities. So different regimes. And there are a number of different statutory processes for environmental impact assessment in Queensland. Preparation of environmental impact statement is one of them and commonly used for large mines. And sixth, approvals for mines involve weighing up broad considerations of jobs and economic benefits versus adverse social and environmental impacts. And in this process, jobs and economics typically trump other considerations. And finally, regulatory capture is a huge problem for environmental regulation in Queensland and Australia and globally. So that's the end of the lecture. Thanks everyone.